Um, this session is about application troubleshooting with process manager, not IDA Pro, and we have the god of troubleshooting over there. You set the bar and I'm just lowering it down to my standards. I barely, I know how to turn on the computer. So we, we can follow it. Yeah. Everyone knows on the other one. So to be honest, I was just in Helga Klein's session and he was very, very friendly and handed out beers. That is, of course, an inspiration to all the other speakers, including myself. But apart from that, uh, what I took away from the session is that his session was an inspiration, how to figure stuff out, right? And not looking at the smaller details, which this is, but more what's happening in our environment, right? And you got really inspired on sitting next to Nate, and we're talking like, oh, we can see this, we can do that, we want to do this, I should get a consultant license, I should get started using this as a customer. My hope is, my session will be just as inspiring for all you guys, not to do the deep level stuff, Remco will teach you that, you can talk to him over beers. But just to get you started, I'm not, sorry, I got it. Just to get you started. So this should be an inspirational session, right? Really just get you started, and first you get a headache but because it's too much, and then it pieces over because you had a beer, right? Good. Um, so, talk about me first, because I'm very important at the moment, because I'm standing up here. My name is Nick Callen. I'm based out of Sweden. Uh, last time we were in Copenhagen, uh, apart from LAX, of course. Uh, I just took the bridge across, so I live in the southern part. Uh, uh, it's a 40 minute train ride, basically, to get to Copenhagen. So that's my home place, that's why I'm, where I work. I spent three years in Denmark, and then I've been traveling to customers in Sweden, primarily based in the southern part all the time. It's great. I uh, joined a company named Know It. Uh, we know it all, right? We're the smart ass. Uh, we're out helping customers. We're actually a little, a little bit more diverse than I'm used to. Uh, I've been primarily working with infrastructure consulting services. Uh, these are only focused on transformation projects, and it's really a lot about how to get a customer in many different areas from where they are to where they want to be, and we're really helping them transform that way. Uh, I'm, of course, doing Microsoft stuff. I've actually, since I've started there, I've not done any Citrix stuff which makes me feel like an odd person at this conference. I can relate to the system center. I don't know what Send desktop version we're using right now. Basically. Is, is it still buggy? Um, I, uh, I'm involved in, so what I do essentially, regardless of what product I'm using, it's always application deployment, meaning getting an app out there to a user in the best way possible. And Sometimes the customer is very focused on, you should do it this way. We're using Citrix, go that way. I think Vue is a good option here. No, we're doing Citrix. And then you just have to go with it and try to make the best of it. Other times you can actually influence decision, local app, centralized app. You do it this way, you do it that way. And this discussion is more open, right? I think all the consultants, everybody consultants here? Anybody working internal? One hand, two hands, okay, a few hands. SMS password, of course, work. <laughs> then you can actually impact the discussion. It's more open, you can bring in more options, basically. That's great. Uh, online, I'm available as, somebody call me CNAC, I say snack. CNAC attack, because it was free, that was, or it was available Twitter handle. Uh, that's my mail address, the website, uh, on the Technum forums, I'm known as CNAC. Uh, um, if you know the character Curious George, my name is Swedish. That's the equivalent, so I'm Curious George, basically. Um, if you want to tweet about it, if you can't tweet about it, please do. And use the hashtag. I think it's Brew afterwards, right? Yeah, but they started using it. Is the internet working at the moment? No. no. Somewhere. 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 <laughs> Actually, I, when I got up in my room and got the laptop, I was able to do stuff, right? For five minutes. <laughs> For five minutes, it's done. Then somebody got the Atlantis ILO. So <laughs> 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 started downloading immediately. <laughs> Don't tell anyone. All right. So, we'll start with the basics. Application troubleshooting. Specific tool we're using for this scenario, obviously, you should have an arsenal of tools. IDA Pro being the last step. Uh, process monitor, perhaps not the first one, figure out what the error is first. But it's a very good tool to use very early in the process, but you should have a defined problem. Process monitor is actually a combination of FileMon and RegMon. Anybody here not use those two tools? Or one guy? 
How young are you? What? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like 15, right? right. They don't have this in Malta. <laughs> so, I just, uh, anybody here disapprove of actually combining Pylon, Megmon a little bit more in the process monitor? Anybody like that separation of tools? Okay, that's good. <clears throat> uh, process monitor uses a filter driver in Windows Vista and upwards. It's very controlled where you stick it in the stack, so filter drivers doesn't uh, conflict with it, it, each other. And if you use the app B, that is actually a very important part. Uh, there was actually a specific order you had to start process monitor to be able to monitor all the activity in app B application use. As I come from that view world, that was very important for me. So you have to start process monitor, then you start the virtual application. With a version of process monitor, I, uh, I, I have no idea which version. They introduced a new switch, which was called external capture, which would actually allow it to hook into that B and not being a, uh, force it to start in that particular manager, uh, man, uh, particular order. So basically, you could just fire it off, use that switch, and you're good to go. Uh, I made a blog article about the difference, and basically, primarily it relates to registry access, meaning you see more or less registry keys being accessed depending on uh, how you start it, with or without the switch, basically. Anybody using App B? Okay, that's my baby, so I feel that's good. Usually at a Microsoft seminar or something, it's like App B. Is that still alive, maybe? Uh, it's a live version, but the Citrix. Since Citrix canceled their product, it's flourishing a bit more in that area. Yeah. So, you double click an executable file, and that's how you start troubleshooting, right? We'll talk about the tool first. We'll get into the trouble part of it a bit later. First of all, it's a very lightweight executable. You get it off uh, Sys Internals, which is now on the Microsoft site. Uh, I believe they have like a, a UNC path you can map up and basically just run it off the internet, the cloud, right? And you can run it from there. I just have a local copy running all the time. And whenever somebody sends me a proc monologue and it's from a newer version, it tells you to update, then I update. Unless you uh, unless you find a bug, right? But Mark Rusinovich never does any bugs, so we're good. <laughs> uh, basically, uh, it's a single executable. It's great because if you're running it on a 64-bit system, you actually have the 32-bit 32-bit version embedded. So if you want to run that one, you can use dash or slash run 32 when you get that one, and you can use that one if you want to. Uh, and uh, the same file, you can download it, obviously, on a 32-bit system, use it there as well. When you start it, this is what you get. You get a little bit more, but this is the primary dialogue you get. Essentially, just filters, right? And makes no sense. What should I do with it? I don't know. I, I have no idea what I'm looking at. So usually what people do is either press OK or cancel, and then stuff happens, right? So the next thing that happens is basically you get a dialogue, maybe not in this particular size, but things start happening, and all the types of events that's occurring in the background will start to show up. And primarily you see the counter down here, and I think I have this running for 30 seconds. I have 781,000 events, and it's just too much for me to process. And obviously if you're a novice and you start looking at it, whatever, how will you make sense of all this data? I have no idea, right? So let's look at it. Uh, first, we have the counter. One, we see showing, even though we capture uh, 800,000 roughly, we only see 341,000 events, meaning our default filters, which is given to us by process monitor, has actually excluded lots of data already. So this is apparently what's relevant on your system, not just hunger monger data. But it really should be relevant in a way. <clears throat> The next one is you actually have an on and off. It's not too obvious maybe if you haven't used it. I actually helped the guy who thought it was the other way around of what it is. So when it's this one, it means it's actually capturing stuff. The looking glass is on, right? We're looking at it, so we're capturing stuff. Not in his world, nope. So this was off in his world. And when he clicked it, it switches on there with like a cross, red cross, right? Red cross, that would indicate bad, off, disabled, red, generally that way not in his mind. So he sent me the capture that contained nothing because it was off the entire time he troubleshooted. It was like, are you really repeating the problem I told you to repeat? Are you really doing that? No, it wasn't. Um, that's great. Uh, obviously, um, you can have issues. I mean, you can stop it, and obviously you should try to stop it when you're doing a capture. Uh, there, I got a tip from Nathan uh, that I should mention. Basically, you can start it with a switch saying no connect, slash no connect. We'll show it in a bit. And what happens then is that 
uh, it will not start capturing immediately, which is great if you want to set up, load a filter, maybe not capture, maybe you, uh, view a previous file. The other one is we can filter out, meaning if we want that file mod, reg mod, if we just want the registry, deselect all of the other ones and you just see the registry capture, right? Great way just to get rid of so much stuff that's not important. If you know you're looking for a registry key, why are you looking at files, for example? Not relevant to this scenario. It's a great way of actually filtering out lots of stuff. Anybody knew about those? Connor's not heckling me yet. Not at heads. <clears throat> the other one is actually backed by virtual memory. Good to know here is that if you're fired up on a VM, if it's a really poor VM, it's not doing too well already, using the virtual memory can actually overload that one. And I've crashed a few VMs just by spinning this one up. And that's interesting. It was intended to go in there and sort a problem, and you just crashed it entirely, and nobody's happy at you. So uh, usually on a physical machine, you're pretty good, regardless of how bad it is nowadays. But in a VM, that could actually matter by using virtual me memory too much and just overloading the machine. So if you have the that command line, uh, and that switch, lots of switches, you can actually specify, as opposed to using the virtual memory, you will use the file and you'll do the write to disk. Of course, uh, consuming lots of IOPS, and that's fun and uh, good and fun, but it's a better way than actually crashing the machine. Um, if you, VMs, basically. Really, really horrible VMs are, are very prone to just going straight down if you let the capture just run immediately. And, of course, then you can use the no connect, you can use the vacuum file and just move the move the entire uh, load of all the data into a file as opposed to memory. Anybody, that happened to anybody? Yeah. 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 All right. I'm not the only one that's done, right? No, it's Should've been 10 times. Done. I'm just, I started this. Busy send machine. Yeah, busy yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And you can also do this via the GUI. Oh, you can? Awesome. I didn't, I, I don't command, no, I'm not command line guy, sorry. Yeah, I'm but not. first, well, first launch, my list, uh, yeah. My <coughs> list, uh, yeah. Right. <laughs> if you do a no connect, you don't start a capture, so you're anyway. So you can do it in multiple ways, which is great. Can you send it to a file share? So you don't consume local IOPS? I don't know. Machine I, I haven't tried that. You, any guys tried it? Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. Uh, it works. It works? <coughs> it works? Okay. It works. The Swiss guy tried it. He's very thorough, so he tries all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta pick a new file. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> So tools, there is a menu called tools and uh, it gives you a few uh, ways to actually get an overview of all the data you just captured. If you of course know exactly what you're looking at, you can start out by filter and creating a filter. It's like a spreadsheet, right? That's what we're looking at. So you can use the filter function to immediately dive down and uh, as I've said, you can disable files if you're uh, only interested in the registry. However, if it's just a blunt of data and you don't really know what you're looking at, you have the tools menu. The tools menu will actually show you quite a few interesting things. As you can see, it, it focuses on summary of different stacks, basically. <clears throat> First one is, if you want to do a file summary, where is the file activity going on, basically? Where is all the writes, the reads, the events happening? Are we doing more in the user's profile, or are we actually doing all this stuff in the program files? And perhaps that could give you an idea what the problem is. Maybe if a file server spots up here and you know it's down, that, is my, that might be the problem, right? This is intending uh, of making sense of the humongous amount of data you have and pointing you in the right direction. <clears throat> the other one is count value occurrences. So you can choose any column you have. Uh, I've used result because this is great. Usually the first thing that people get in touch with process monitor is finding an access denied, right? You have an app, you run it as a uh, restricted user, it crashes, what are you looking for? An access denied. That's what essentially happens in the background. So if you have count value occurrences, it only takes one, all it takes is one, but maybe you have multiple failures and you actually see multiple access denies. And obviously success will probably be on the top, hopefully. Uh, but you can create a filter on this one as well and exclude that one so you don't have to care about it. So I'll show a few cases a bit later on. <clears throat> this one I've done a few times. Process Monitor has a menu, as you can see, and you can enable boot logging. What happens is that you check this one and you restart, and the entire process of starting up the computer will be logged and will be written to a file. Problem is that sometimes things happen and you forget that you enabled boot logging. And then eight days later, you're out of disk space. I 
I, I, I vaguely remember somebody saying on Twitter they forgot as well, so I'm not the only one. But I've forgotten a couple of times. I'm like, why do I have 20 megabytes left on my C drive? What? And then you start looking at with you know different tools. What's that? And then you try to start process monitor. What is writing to my disk? No, oh, you have an active session you're currently running, and you've been running for the last three days. Very powerful tool, and actually, yes, it does capture everything that happens during startup. But again, a lot of data. Don't forget it because you will consume a lot of space. And perhaps doing it on your old laptop, you can laugh at it. Doing it at a server, that's fun. And prop on one C itself, right? Right. No, what will happen is that the next time you fire it up, it's like, oh yeah, I just got to process this, this humongous log I have. And it's, you know, it's big. It's like the fish, it grows all the time. <laughs> <clears throat> so, we want to create a baseline, right? If you have no idea what you're looking at, or if you have uh, defined your problem a little bit, uh, and you, you kind of know what you're looking at, but you don't really know if you're looking for an access denied or a name not found, or if it's just a resource, or maybe it's slow, so you don't really know what is slow, what is that. Is that multiple attempts trying to reach a resource which is not available, or is that multiple attempts trying to create something which you can't due to an access denied? So creating a baseline of just minimizing the data is a great way to start. What do you do? You fire it up, and you let it capture everything. And what do you do next? Exclude stuff, kick it out, right? So what normally happens on a system when you're not invoking that problem? Start excluding that one. I, I'm, I'm kind of ambivalent here because I don't want to say just exclude all these processes. I could give you a list, right? This is fairly safe to exclude. But that might not be the particular case in your instance, right? So I usually just monitor what's happening. Let's start removing things. Obviously, the, the quick one is exclude, just right click a process and uh, choose exclude the process name. In this case, SVC host, right? SVC host, that runs how many instances? A few, right, on any Windows machine. Does it do thing, things in the background? Yes. Does it have anything to do with your problem? Maybe not. Let's exclude it and see if we go, need to go back to it later. So we start by excluding it. We're, of course, not limited to a process. We can do it on any column, right? So I discussed this also. Uh, name not found may be applicable, may not be applicable. Success, is that bad or is that good? I don't know. Maybe you need to know that there was a success. Maybe you don't need to know that there was a success. So you can play around with what fits your scenario. But essentially, what I always do is I start with the process and just remove as many processes uh, in the beginning to not be reviewing what's normal system activity basically. So what advice do you have to filter out the false positives? Like name not found. <laughs> I'll okay. Well I'll try to showcase to inspire you to do okay. the right thing. I will not lay down the law and say this is how to do it. But usually what I do is just normal system activity by process I start out is just exclude it immediately. And then you start repeating the problem and you can Try to avoid the old issues. The advice I would show to that question is just if you if you do have a situation where you have a working version, it's always the best place to start because you can then see what is normal. Start going. I'll get back to that one. You're jumping ahead. Shh, quiet. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Then you have another option: highlight <laughs> spot. You have a highlight as well, so you can choose include and exclude. Right? Those are pretty easy to understand. Highlight is great if you say, "Oh, this is user configuration." Maybe it's in the user profile. Let's highlight everything that happens in the user profile, right? So you say, see users, you don't even know to need to know what user it is, unless you're a synap box, because then it might be 50 users, right? So you highlight a specific pattern, right? And as opposed to you looking, it's like, is this a user file? Just let's it highlight based on a pattern. And the filter uh, works the same way, both for include, exclude, and highlight, meaning the filter can go grow pretty advanced. You can start with, you can end with, you can contain, can be exactly this one, for example, uh, which is great. Meaning if you know that, well, user configuration, what can a user configuration be? I'll give a few samples of that one. The other one is toggle bookmarks. You can do a bookmark. I think we have toggle bookmark. So we have toggle bookmark, and that means, well, this is a place of interest, right? There's something here. I don't know quite what it is. Maybe I need to go back to it. Do I want to scroll up the 10,000 lines, or do I, oh, let's just talk a bookmark and I can jump back and forth between two, two different locations. And I'm suspecting maybe the problem starts here or here. So I have two bookmarks jumping back and forth. And it's a great way to remember if you have a spot of interest, basically. That's great, right? <coughs> 
next step is actually that we need to save data, of course. So if you don't figure it out immediately, and maybe you have a working scenario, right? You want to save the data, and you need to reset and create that working scenario. So obviously, you save the data, and you can compare it to at a later stage. So Process Monitor allows you to save it. Just file, save, like any other Windows application. Amazing, right? What does not happen is that this is, this is the default prompt, apart from my username, that will be presented to you. So if you just file, save, and click OK, OK, uh, you will save a file. Problem is, with this file, is that the default setting is events displayed, meaning we will only see what we're currently seeing. Do you know if that's relevant in the future or not? No. So what you should do is always, always, always check this one, all events. You should always save a Pokemon log with all the events. Unless you really, really know what you're looking at and have really defined and narrowed the scope. Second topic is obviously name the file something useful. There's a default name to it. It's a horrible name, and if you have many uh, many files, give it a descriptive name so you can relate to the scenario you're looking at. Uh, this is a sample. I actually I just looked at a folder I had uh, laying around my laptop where I have well. Application CV4, right? It's a few different scenarios. By the name, I can probably relate to what's happening. It's kind of. And of course, the last step is get it off the VM, which you will reset in a few minutes. Because if you don't get it off the VM, save it on another file share or drive or computer or whatever. <coughs> Obviously, if you reset the VM, you lose the Pokemon log. I've done that so many times, and I realize i got to reset, redo the scenario, redo the capture, redo the save, and get it off there as opposed to me just resetting and starting that other, other scenario I had in mind, really. And it's just something you do too many times, essentially. And it's always when you're stressed and don't have time, right? You're really, really stressed. <clears throat> so, we talked about the tools. I've given you a few tweaks and tips and uh, basically gotten you started, right? So you know how to start the tool, you know where to start to exclude a bunch of stuff, talk a little bit, how to narrow it down. This is a tool, so it will not help you finding out the problem if you don't define the problem. We talked about the, me and Connor talked about the process of elimination. If you don't do the process of elimination, meaning try to figure out where it actually starts breaking. Narrow down the scenario so you have it explicitly saying, this is where it breaks. When I click this button, when I do this, when the user executes that, this is where the problem occurs. Not during the log on, not during the connection of this other thing, not during this and this and this. And without narrowing that scope, if you just use this tool, obviously if you have a wide scope, you have a wide set of data. And it means more work for you because you have to filter out that data, right? So if you don't define and narrow down the problem, you still have tons of stuff to do. <clears throat> Second part is, of course, if you have a problem, even if you figured it down, maybe you don't know how to reproduce it. And that's a hard part, right? The user has a random crash, a random problem occurring. How do you troubleshoot it, right? Sometimes the user could repeat it, but I can't. So obviously I cannot reproduce it, but I need the user to do it. Obviously you can monitor those, but then you need to explain to the user, you need to be really careful, you need to go up to this point and do these steps. And after that, I need to say okay, because I need to fire up this one. I don't want to capture excessive amount of data, because I maybe run out of virtual memory, right? But then you got to assist the user in helping them narrowing down the problem for you, basically. <clears throat> so problem with process monitor, and that's why we have the filters, is the amount of data. And of course, narrowing it down, do it, you need to do it, otherwise you have too much data to process. So of course it's overwhelming at first. <clears throat> so we'll look at it. I'll make it a three-step process, I think, uh, of it. Basically, uh, first, of all, you, uh, first of all, you need the issue, right? You need to know what the problem is. If somebody says sign up is slow, is that a problem? It's a user experience. We can't say it's a problem because we don't really know if it's sign up slow. We don't know if it's on the machine, if it's on the client, if, if it's the network, what it is. We need to define the problem. We need to know if it's reproducible, uh, reproducible as well. Maybe it's just a random thing occurring on every Tuesday's uh, second week in the month, right? Then we need to know we need to be in that specific area. For the rest of the month, it's not applicable. <clears throat> of course, to do something useful, we do need to do the minimum amount of time, meaning we try to narrow down the problem as much as possible. Once we actually get to the point where we want to do a capture, you would have two different scenarios. Do we have a working and a not working scenario? And that's the most obvious one, right? We have one piece here over there, it's working, and then we have this one, which is 
uh, sample user corresponding to our 10,000 users who are not too happy about us right now. That's the other scenario. Can we compare the two? Have we defined our scope so much so we can compare the two and try to narrow it down? That's a great way to start. Then baseline. Maybe the baseline on this one is not the same as the baseline on this other system. So really troubleshooting is about creating that baseline and maybe you need to be really unique uh, between the two systems. <clears throat> and after that, it's just follow it. Then we have to see where it goes, right? So I'll talk about a few different Windows behaviors and then after that I'll do, I'm getting started. Uh, after that I'll actually do a few cases of, uh, you, anybody seen Mark Percinovich Mark talks? He has a case of, and he does like my grandma called and said <laughs> Windows was slow. <laughs> And you're like, I use Parklon and I did this. And you know, it goes on a wild goose chase. Hopefully not as good as that. So everybody knows, everybody knows how Windows searches for a file, sort of. You can explicitly say this is a file, or you can actually do a search which follows this order, basically. Um, if a file is not found, we can actually have lots of false positives, right? If you don't understand how Windows behaves, how do you know which one's um, how do you know which one's important? Well, so if Windows is searching for a file and needs to traverse lots of different places, it can actually look like this, right? So you have lots of lots of attempts to find a very specific file. We have file name, path not found, name not found. It goes all the way up, but at the very end of it, it will actually find the file. Meaning all this is useless. It's not important. It was Windows doing its job, and the final result was the one, great, we found the file, right? That was the one that mattered. Then it made 20 other attempts. It's not relevant. It was just doing what it's told to do, right? I've actually had a case where I, I was uh, surprised uh, once. I was troubleshooting an Oracle client, because that's what you do on a Tuesday. <laughs> and when, what happens is that I can see that it finds the file. So I actually have name not found, and it's doing as it does, traversing all the directories and then it finds the file, and then it keeps on going. What's the problem, right? Why is it not working? What's happening? The problem was, it's the wrong architecture. It's looking for a 32-bit, and it's a 64-bit file, or the other way around, perhaps. So it's not the file, it needs the right architecture of the file, right? And this is a great one if actually, if you do any type of packaging, if you're troubleshooting an MSI installer, if you're troubleshooting any type of custom wrapper which does things in the background, which you have no idea what it is, right? So you can see a process, right? You see all the processes, there's an action, there's a result, you can see it start. When it actually starts, that's great because you know there's other stuff and one process spawns a different process, right? But in addition to actually just seeing that happen, we also have the ability to see how does it start? What's the command line? What's the current working directory? Does it have any specific variables? In that one, command line, Awesome. It's so great to just know that this specific installer or this wrapper initiated other stuff in the background and did it with this command line. And then I, I was talking to Nathan, that's the easiest way to find out how do you install this custom driver which you wrapped in this executable file with these parameters I have no knowledge about basically. Anybody doing packaging? Okay, a few guys. Good stuff. <clears throat> then you have the other one. Slow performance, right? This is actually me starting uh, iExplore uh, on my corporate laptop, my previous corporate laptop. That's why I've shaded out the URL. Uh, basically what happens is that it attempts to connect to a to a proxy server. That's great, right? Anything wrong? We have a reconnect, reconnect? Yeah, that's pretty good, nothing too bad. But if you look at the difference here, you have 21, 27. So I have sec six seconds basically waiting for it to connect to my proxy. Do I have the patience for six seconds? <laughs> Obviously not. Does any user have the patience for this? No. That is the problem. Sometimes it's not really a problem you're looking at. It's just a behavior. So you have to follow the flow. What's happening? What, how long does it take? What I found out while troubleshooting this is there's actually a, another column which is named, I see if I can find it, duration. So if you want to see the duration of a specific operation, you can actually append a column. And once you do that, you get a brand new column and you can actually see the duration of any specific operation. This is great. I don't know if you can sort on it. I don't think you can sort on duration. But then again, you can do the count value occurrences and you can see where you're at in stack, basically. Great thing to just summarize. Um, if you want to have even better overview, I would almost 
use Uber again by Helga. It's an even better problem. Then you can see really bad performance. <clears throat> we have another one. Uh, I was troubleshooting the attempt to send an email through what application is it? Adobe Reader. Adobe Reader. I don't know what version 10. I think it's 10. Maybe, maybe not. Essentially, the user goes into the application, clicks send an email, and it says, you do not have a mail client. Hmm. Yes, I do, I tell the user. I'm a mail client. And basically what happens is that you find out that tons of stuff happened, and there's all these things going on. But this is essentially a failed attempt to use a default mail client. Why? I can open Outlook, I can start it, I can see it's running, I, I can send email, I can go do other stuff using the send to, and I can see that something is returned back. What's happening? Well, in particular what happens is that, do you see, do you see the top line I marked? Uh, there's a specific register key called DLL XPath. Apparently by following the trail, what I had to do was figure out why is it accessing every specific uh, register key. Uh, that specific register key, when an application attempts to use that one, it means it's using extended mapping. Apparently, I had Outlook, I have a virtual instance of Outlook, and apparently Microsoft did not bring in support for virtual instance Outlook using extended mapping. Outlook obviously supports extended mapping, Microsoft wrote it. Virtual Outlook, no support. Other mail clients not ex uh, supporting extended mapping, Thunderbird, for example, no support. So if you're using Acrobat or Reader uh, with the Thunderbird or a virtual Outlook, you would have no support for the extended mapping. I think they changed that in version 5, so this is a version 4 problem of the Appy product. But basically, you have to figure out what's happening. There you go. And if, as soon as I figured out the DLL path extended mappy, it was just a nice, I, I didn't even have to open a support call. It's just ask a Microsoft guy, do you support extended mappy? You don't have this red key. You're not placing this one down. And he's mumbling, and you know, you're not. That's it. I don't need to talk any further. As you're mumbling, I understand the answer, basically. So, again, what are you looking for? Gone back, we didn't know what we're looking for. It tells me I don't have a default mail client. I can even see it finding my register key for the mail client. Other one, not so obvious. Most of the time, the most common one where people get started is finding the access denied. That's where people really start out, saying I have a permissions problem, how do you find it? You filter on access denied, you don't even do the exclusion, you don't care about the success, you don't care about the name not found, you just do a filter for access denied. Most people who start using Procmon, that's the way to do it. Great start, you started doing something, right? Maybe you will use it more extensively the next time. You will at least learn how to use basic filtering. Or maybe figure it out on your, uh, your own how to do it more extensively. The other one is, of course, well, if you're looking for user configuration, anybody who worked in, uh, with RES workspace services or absence for doing the capturing, or any other emoji or flex profiles, basically, uh, you can start looking for different type of configuration files. Registry is, of course, a, a great way to store uh, configuration, user configuration. But you also have the ini files, which is, you know, from the 90s. We love it. We have the XML files, which is the ini files of the, this decade, basically. That's great. Uh, but we have different locations as well. So you can, I know uh, Java applications in particular don't care about these extensions. They make up their own because it's fun. But they store it in particular locations, right? So you can start looking at like, locations. And as you don't know what you're looking for, at least you know where you're looking for it, right? If you want to look at uh, Internet Explorer problems, maybe you're having issues due to a proxy server or a lockdown or a mix of configuration, this is where Internet Explorer has the most common settings. Uh, you can obviously have, I did not write, I wrote HTLM and HTCU, meaning uh, you can have both machine settings and current user, right? Common issue, you have conflicting settings. You're expecting user settings, whereas Internet Explorer is actually being locked down on a machine level. That's a very common troubleshooting scenario. You with me? I'll let you go. I think I'm one minute over time. <clears throat> so again, what is relevant? Is success relevant? Well, we don't know. We saw the previous example where we're actually traversing 20, 30, 40 directories, and name not found is not relevant for one of them because the last one was a success. One success to just cancel out all of them. So learning how to filter and just follow the flow of the application, what it's doing, how it's accessing things, is more important. So it's, I would actually start out by narrowing down by process because usually then you can figure out what the application is doing in the background. <clears throat> I'll do cases. I have no, I think I'm out of time, but I'm. Uh, okay. <laughs>
So we'll do a few cases. So I'm Mr. Detective. I'm not App Detective. Some other guy in the U.S. is really whining about things. <laughs> so uh, basically, we have an application called SPS, SPSS Legacy Viewer. Uh, it's an old application. I think you actually can download this off the internet if you want to. Um, I have two crashes. I uh, have one crash. Basically, it doesn't work as a user, right? It works as an admin. So immediately, I have the non-working, working scenario, right? Then, is the issue defined? Well, it crashes when I copy things. It doesn't crash when I start it. It doesn't crash when I print. It doesn't crash when I open objects. It only crashes when I try to copy an object and paste it somewhere, or just copy the, the thing, actually. Meaning, for me to monitor the startup of this application, not important. For me to monitor uh, the, the opening of that object, not important, maybe. Don't know yet. <clears throat> So what actually happens is I get the project manager to actually do the park monitor. Tell him it, tell him the scenario, get him up and running, and basically uh, he just does it flawlessly. Now he saves it the right way. What does he say? All the events. He sends it to me and says this is where uh, this is uh, my issue occurring. I don't have any filter. I have all the data collected. You know how to turn it off and on. They mix them up. <clears throat> Then he sends me the installation files, meaning I can reproduce anything I want to in a VM I have. Right? I can reproduce the scenario in my environment, so I don't have to call him and say, please try this on your phone. Um, first, first thing I do is I'm looking at a capture, all events. Obviously, it's all the background activity on his machine. Where do I start? I don't know. I have no idea. I'll do count value occurrences and just see what's running. Obviously, we can see a few processes running here. Uh, we have services, we have a few other things, but that's background activity. However, we have the bare fault. A bare fault would indicate that something happened, right? Something crashed. Maybe that's the breaking point, because I know whatever happened before that would indicate it's perhaps not operating as it should. Okay, that's fine. I figured out that the main application, that's the process. Uh, so, obviously now I have a perfect filter. I have the bare fault, if I know the timing of that one, and I know my main process, Way to go, right? Great start. <clears throat> and obviously, when you look at it, we can immediately see on my uh, filter, I have 3,551 events. Uh, I started out with 20,000. That's a pretty good narrow down. I can see bare fault, process start. I know this is where the crash started, or I experienced. And then you start looking. Well, it tries to read a few things, success, success, and then suddenly, you have the name not found, right? Is that bad? Is name not found bad? Oh, well, I don't know. I have a working scenario though. I can compare it to the working scenario. So basically what happens is I, I uh, take this one, I just open it up in a machine where I have the uh, installation working, and I just press jump to. That's on the right click menu. And basically I just press jump to on that key and see where I end up. What I figured out is I could export out these keys. Just send it to him, he imports it, and reply gets is all in capitals which either means, in any, any language, <laughs> you're the king, guess which one sent me, or you're a douche, what happened? Basically, he's really happy with that I sent him the red keys and just told the packager, please include this, good to go, right? So this one's fairly easy, I figure out where the breaking <coughs> point is, I go up to, what's the odd thing happening just before the crash? What's standing out, and how does that compare to my working scenario? Pretty troubleshooting scenario, right? <clears throat> There we go. I just wanted to illustrate. He did not know how to name the file correctly. Logfile.pml. That's a bad name for any. <clears throat> okay, case of installation timing. I think I got to speed it up. Uh, case of installation timing. Essentially, we have an application that shows the wrong version. A registry key is identified, meaning the application version is actually saved in a specific registry key. There is no registry key in the MSI file actually indicating that this is the one, that's the one that's set. However, there are so many custom actions, I cannot count that high, basically. Problem is, they don't have a naming convention. I don't know if they're setting a red key, copying a file, or doing something else. So, which one sets it? Well, what I do is I fire up, run it, enable verbose logging. Does everybody figure out that command line? Not too comfortable, uncomfortable? Okay. Then I capture the entire installation, and it takes me a ton of data, and it took took me 1 minute 27 uh, seconds to process 5% of it, so that took forever. It's 3 million events. What do I do with that? Nothing. Basically, I have already my filter, right? I know the red key. All I need to figure out is what time does it happen, when does it get set, and then I can just filter on my red key. 
So I have a very, very, very narrow filter. I know the red key, I know it's set, and then I just need the time of it. What happens next? I just compare it to my verbose installation log, and I can say, oh, I have these suspects for a custom action that would set these red key. The timing matches on my procmon, the timing matches on my installation log. Great, right? Obviously, I found it, condition is wrong, initiate it at the wrong one, don't, don't do it. Basically, just change the condition, condition, good to go. Great, right? <coughs> Next scenario, last one, then I'm out. <clears throat> uh, basically is that the iTunes prompts every single user for a end user license agreement. As you all know from the this session, everybody reads them and it takes a lot of time and thereby reduces productivity in any company, right? <laughs> Imagine all the Microsoft viewers you have to read. They, they call it software license agreement, not end user license agreement. Uh, what they have people figured out is that is in a file called iTunes preps.xml, it's saved whether you have read and accepted it. And for every major version or major changes, they change a bit of code, meaning have we updated you will I need it to present to you again. So what, what do packagers do? We solve it by save the file, copy it in the profile, done, right? And you can do this by absence of rest. That's a best practice and I'm really lazy. I don't like that custom action. This is crap. I really don't like the scenario. It's got to be clean away. But I have no idea what Apple is doing. There's no documentation of this uh, being done in any other way. So do a Procmon capture of the entire start and start digging into it. Now we're talking about the scenario. What am I looking for? I have no idea what I'm looking for. I don't know if this is a user setting. I don't know if they've implemented anything. I don't know if there's a better way to actually do it. After reading all, I think it's like a million lines capture in here. But after reading through all this one, I found one thing that just doesn't add up. There's a reg key called SLA under local machine. There's no documentation about it. There's nothing setting it. There's no machine in the entire network that has this reg key set. There's no, there's no blog article. I just Googled for it. There's no blog article about it. So I'm pondering, maybe it has something to do with it. I'm thinking EULA. I want a reg key named EULA. But SLA seems kind of to fit. And when I actually read the title bar of the dialogue they present me with, it says software license agreement, and the acronym starts that up, right? What happens is, after many tries and attempts, and I did not have IDA Pro, after many tries and attempts, simply by try and fail, meaning I did a reg word, I did a one, no change. I did a reg word, I did a zero, no change. I did yes, I did no, I did tons of stuff, nothing worked. But then I came back to the scenario, well, I have a value that's just out of the blue from the preference file. What if I try to insert that one? And obviously, yes, that worked. Creating that red key, just creating that uh, particular one, inserting SLA and the value from the iTunes preps. I'm guessing you have to recheck the new value for every new iTunes version, because why make it simple? And basically, suddenly you have something where you don't have to impact user profile. Customer was really happy. We did not override user preferences. And we could actually we can lock down the iTunes installation fairly good as well. So the deployment was very clean, no reboot required. <coughs> Uh, no overwriting of user, user preferences. Installation time was greatly decreased by this. Awesome, right? Customers happy, I'm happy. Apple, well, I have to write documents, right? This is too much work. And I don't have either code because I can't afford a license. So. <laughs> okay, I'm going to wrap it up. I think I'm one minute overdue. Thank you very much for having me. I hope I didn't talk too fast. <laughs>